In the last few years, we can witness the publication of a number of works on the sociology of translation or on related issues. I do not want to go into detail here, but what seems important for the context of this symposium is the nature of these publications. I would like to split them into publications stemming from our own discipline and those written by scholars outside translation studies, if ever we can draw an exact line between these groups. So works from inside the discipline. Here we have a number of works on the role of translators and interpreters, the sociology of the profession, if you want. For instance, a challenging study uh, like that by Rothfuss Bastian, Frauen und Männer im Übersetzerberuf, eine Untersuchung bei den Sprachendiensten der Institutionen der Europäischen Union in 2004, who analyzes the motivations and professional engagement of translators in the European Union in a gender-specific context. Next, we all know the special issue of the translator in 2005 dedicated to the adoption of Pierre Bourdieu's sociology of culture under various angles. The volume edited by Anthony, Miriam and Susanna Yetmarova, Sociological Aspects of Translating and Interpreting in 2006 is a valuable contribution to the role of the agents behind translation in a cultural and social perspective. The book edited by me and Alexandra Fukari, Constructing a Sociology of Translation, in 2007, tries to sort out the potentials of an emerging sociology of translation with a strong focus on theoretical frameworks developed in sociology and their possible adoption in translation studies. Jean-Marc Gouinvic is perhaps the one who tries to adopt the sociological method in the most consistent way. This can be seen in his, in his recent book, Pratique sociale de la traduction, 2007, where he once again puts to the test Boudieu's cultural sociology. The book, The Conference of the Tongues, published by Theo Hermanns in 2007, extensively draws on Niklas Luhmann's social systems theory. Hermanns is not interested in demonstrating that translation is a social system. He rather argues that the constructivist outlook of social system theory means that the theory assumes that there are systems. He thus tries to, I quote, redescribe translation using the terms and perspective of social systems theory, thus aiming at the description of translation as a social system, not as an ontological proof, but as the deployment of a conceptual apparatus. Additionally, he particularly aims at a more self-reflexive translation studies. Hans Vermeer, too, reflects Luhmann in terms of translation. In his Luhmann's social systems theory, preliminary fragments of a theory of translation, in 2006, he claims to interpret Luhmann's social systems theory in its application to translation, of course under a Scopus perspective. He rediscusses certain features of Luhmann's theory for the purpose of their applicability to translation. For me, however, it is more a finger exercise in sharpening the Scopus theory's claims and not so much broadens our insight into the functioning of translation in society. To sum up, we can see that in the sociologically relevant pub, uh, works done in translation studies, there is a strong focus on Pierre Bourdieu and more recently also on Niklas Luhmann. Especially the extensive reflection on Bourdieu is understandable in view of the broad applicability of his analytical tools, uh, mostly due to the complexity of his theory. Now let us have a look on what is coming from outside the discipline. First, there is an article by Martin Fuchs to be published in the next few weeks in Translation Studies, in the third issue. He talks about social integration in society from a socio-anthropological point of view. He claims that social integration is not based on consensus but on difference and that it takes place on the level of social interaction between integrative units through translation, 
between their respective abstract or everyday languages and meanings, and between those meanings, languages, and concrete practices. The different institutions, systems, and milieus, discourses, or social fields would not coexist and intersect if not through the mediation of translations. The notion of translation opens up the opportunity for a new understanding of social praxis and of social life in general. This social translation approach is thus interested in the translation dimensions of social praxis. This approach might be compared with the notion of translation as used in Bruno Latour's actor network theory, which refers to mediations, displacements, and assemblages, not just between persons, but also between persons, humans, and objects, non-humans, and to processes which are not just semiotic, but also material. Another very interesting approach I would like to mention is that of Boris Puden and Stefan Novotny, who have been working on cultural translation from a philosophical perspective. Similar to Martin Fuchs, they conceive of translation as a social relation and a field of social practices. Their claim is that thought of in terms of social practices rather than in terms of rendition, an investigation into linguistic and translational processes cannot be reduced to the paradigm of communication, which precisely suggests pre-existing linguistic communities that enable communication on the one hand and failures of communication that necessitates the work of translators on the other. Instead, it has to start, they say, from an analysis of different modes of address that are established on the grounds of a heterolingual condition. Again, this foregrounds linguistic and translational processes as based on a social relation, namely that between the addresser and the addressee. However, it also allows for the analysis of different regimes of addressing what Naoki Sakai calls the regime of homolingual address as opposed to heterolingual address can thus not only be examined in terms of its theoretical and practical presuppositions but also in view of its direct political and social implications in terms of the ways in which it configures figures and shapes the interrelations between different subjects and subject groups. As we can see from these two thought-provoking examples, fresh air rather comes from outside the discipline. One more argument in favor of this transdisciplinary work. In any case, we have to be aware of the problems of such cooperations which particularly lie in the incongruence in scientific standards scientific discourse and mental perception. So what specific problems do we address or have to be addressed? What methodologies are needed? First, I would like to mention the complex issue of the responsibility in terms of socio-political questions. The responsibility of translation studies researchers and teachers in terms of socio-political questions has to be stressed again and again. Too often we are confronted with persons or groups who uncritically serve the so-called requirements of the market and foster ideologies following the logics of neoliberal economic relations, something which is often also expected by recent university reforms, of course. So we have to be aware that we educate our students not for the market, but for society. And this claim has, of course, far-reaching consequences. If thus we take this claim seriously, we also have to take seriously its consequences. 
These are, first and foremost, the implications on the concept of translation on the one hand and on the research domain, the object bereich, on the other. Let me discuss this in some more detail. A recent communication from the Commission of the European Parliament carries the title Multilingualism, an Asset for Europe and a Shared Commitment. The communication opens with the noble words, the harmonious coexistence of many languages in Europe is a powerful symbol of the European Union's aspiration to be united in diversity, one of the cornerstones of the European project. Languages define personal identities, but are also part of a shared inheritance. They can serve as a bridge to other people and open access to other countries and cultures, promoting mutual understanding." End of quote. This aspiration sounds indeed like a challenging project. Undoubtedly, there has been a lot of progress in the European Union in terms of minority languages. Let me only recall the example of the Macedo Romanian language, Aromanian which would have continued to be seen by Greek authorities as a Greek dialect without the powerful intervention of the European Union and the subsequent recognition of Aromanian as a minority language with all its consequences. Let me come back to the EU, EU's communication. What is the role of translation in this communication? Quite or not surprisingly, the term translation is primarily used in the chapter languages and competitiveness, where it, meant to foster, it's, it's, it is meant to foster business relations, and secondly, in the context of new technologies and media. I quote, the media, new technologies, and human automatic translation services can bring the increasing of languages and cultures in the EU closer to citizens and provide the means to, uh, to cross language barriers." End of quote. And the chapter triumphantly closes with the words, finally, human translation is also, of course, a major way of accessing other cultures. As Umberto Eco said, the language of Europe is translation. End of quote. So what translation concept is meant here? Translation for the better understanding between the European Union citizens, of course, but how can this be handled when translation is seen as a mere instrument to guarantee communication from an obviously objective, unbiased perspective? Who translates what, for which purpose, with which strategies? Such papers, and we can find many similar ones once we skip through the European Union's websites, create a mythical concept of translation, the ultimate means to gain a congruous coexistence of people with equal social and political rights. The everyday situation of migrants in the European Union is one of the shameful proofs of the failure of this translation concept. 